Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? Thank you. What an absolute privilege it is to start off this conversation and to start off this wonderful two days. I can't thank enough ABTA and my, the wonderful co-chairs, Dr. Chang and Dr. Liu. Thank you so much for the privilege of speaking. I want to give a warm welcome to everyone online. And this is going to be archived, so make sure to have friends, family, anyone in your tribe look back at this going forward. So I get to talk about the classification of tumors to kick off this treatment session. So we're going to talk about tumors within the nervous system, and it's composed of different parts. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system are the cranial nerves that leave the brainstem and the, and the spinal nerves. And then the autonomic nervous system is what runs our body, our heart rate, our digestion, our sensations, our taste, things like that. We're going to focus our talk today and large portions on the brain of the central nervous system in adults. But other speakers and all of us between the different sessions are happy to talk about any tumors that are not expressly talked about in a presentation. Anytime, come up to any of us. So let's get started. So brain tumors either start in the brain or they spread to the brain. So tumors that start in the brain are often called primary brain tumors. If they spread to the brain, they're often called metastatic or secondary brain tumors. Primary brain tumors are most common in childhood and after 40 years old. Secondary brain tumors are more common as people get older with systemic or body tumors. So about 20 to 40% of body tumors spread into the nervous system and are clinically relevant and need treatment during someone's lifetime. And they're about 10 times more common than primary brain tumors. The classification of adult brain tumors involves the site of origin. So when we talk about primary brain tumors, tumors that started within the brain, one of the terms you hear is called glioma. Glioma is a Greek or Latin word for glia, sounds like glue, support, the support cells. So I think of the brain as being just as complex as a house. You have plumbing and electricity and fiber optics. You have the support. Well, the support of the brain, just like in the house, the drywall, the wood, that's the glia cells. And there's three types, gliomas, astrocytomas, which is a star-shaped cell. We're going to talk about it in a little bit. They get put in grades one through four. A type with a specific molecular feature is called a glioblastoma. There's another type of cell called an oligodendrocyte. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And then a third cell type called an appendicyte or ependymoma. Oma means body or mass or collection. So the word, the cell type, and then oma or mass, that's how we name these tumors. There are also cells in the brain that are not glia support cells. Lymphocytes, immune system cells, medulloblastomas, which are um, immature cells coming from development, or meningothelial cells or meningiomas, which are actually along the lining. Then there's secondary tumors that spread to the central nervous system, and these are some of the common types. Let's talk a little bit about classification as it relates to behavior, or we'll often call the personality or the behavior of the tumor. What's this behavior going to be like of this tumor? Well, we often will comment on words that sound very hard to understand at first, benign and malignant. Well, what is benign and malignant? Well, they're in an attempt to try to characterize behavior. A benign tumor tends to grow slowly, does not tend to spread. Often local treatment leads to a cure, and there is less of an impact on length and quality of life. However, a malignant tumor on the other end of the spectrum tends to grow faster, does tend to want to spread, always requires accommodations of treatment, and then to date there is no cure. There is definitely more of an impact on length of life. Primary tumors that start in the CNS tend to be grouped. We know that gliomas, support cells, are almost always malignant except for the very early grades, but even lower grades can become more malignant in behavior through time. 
non-gliomas, lymphomas are malignant, medulloblastomas are malignant, and meningiomas along the lining outside the brain are benign except for the higher grade. Metastatic tumors, by definition, spread to the brain and are therefore always malignant. We classify tumors also based on pathology. Through the last 150 years, it was mostly using a microscope and stains. However, more recently, we use fancy equipment and do a lot of amazing things to get the behavior of the tumor. So when we had microscopes and stains, we could pick out the cell type and whether it was it a glial tumor or a non-glial tumor, what part of the body did it, or the brain did it start in. But now, and this cartoon on the right is meant to be just a feeling of how complex it is now to classify tumors. To date, however, CNS tumors, for the most part, we don't know how to cure them, but we're helping people live better and longer all the time. They almost always tend to recur, and often more aggressively. They want to spread, and they definitely impact symptoms and quality of life. They're currently life or, or uh, length of life limiting. When we had historical histology, we weren't really able to get the true things we want out of testing, which would be we couldn't really predict behavior, we really couldn't select treatment, we couldn't monitor the treatment or the person, and we didn't have enough tools to improve treatment with historical classification. An example would be the picture on the left, the above right MRI, is a tumor that has a lot of features of a worrisome looking tumor, but then it behaves incredibly uh, slowly and benignly. On the other hand, the picture at the bottom, the MRI, looks actually kind of quiet and boring, but that kind of tumor tends to be more aggressive behaving. So we knew more work needed to be done. So since 2021, we now call integrative histology, integrative classification, which combines molecular data and is constantly being updated. There's a term you may see in your PATH reports called CMPAC now, and that is a dedication of worldwide pathologists and clinicians continually updating PATH for all of us. What are the advantages to this? Well, it means it's up to date, it's gonna be very individualized to the patient you care about, it better predicts behavior, and it helps to select and improve treatments. So let's look at what that might mean. Again, the picture on the right is just meant to be a philosophical, emotional slide to say, lots has changed. So that means that all of us in the room or people that we love would have had a tumor classified differently at one time, is classified away now, and it's probably gonna be classified a different way in the future. So let's talk about two terms you hear all the time, prognosis and prediction. We use those terms in layman's terms, we use those terms in spiritual terms, we use those terms all the time, but what the heck do they mean? I like to think about it as things like nature versus nurture. Yeah, do you come from good genes? Great, that's working for you. But do you have access to healthy nutrition, access to education? That's gonna get you even further, and it modifies and augments off of good genes, okay? So the picture I like to use to think about that concept, we, the two red balls at the top, they're gonna represent a tumor cell, okay? So does some internal influence in that tumor cell kind of fate that behavior to be a particular way? The picture on the right, the star is over the events listed as an arrow. Is there things that we can do to manipulate and alter the outcome and to be able to predict that outcome from an external event. So you also hear about the terms markers. What are my molecular genetics? What are my markers? What are these things? A more generic term would be aberrations or offsets, okay, something off. So markers within each person's tumor cell help us develop, select, and improve treatments. So when we want to be precise or individualized, that's gotten termed often precision medicine. I want precise precision medicine for me and my loved one. So that means we don't give all the patients the same treatment and then say, why does one person do better than the other? How come one person had a side effect different than the other? No, no, what we want to do is we want to pick the exact right recipe to the top level of our knowledge so that we can better select better predict and better help each patient.
So examples of some of those markers, we're gonna go over in the next few slides. They're always updating, they're always changing. Talk with your multidisciplinary team about the markers that are relevant for your tumor or your family member's tumor. We're gonna talk about those in a few minutes. Whenever possible, if you hear at our tumor board someone's recommending to you to get new tissue, this is why. Sometimes the markers change as the tumor changes or is influenced by treatment and time, and sometimes you actually need fresh tissue to process that new test. It helps us increase our clinical trial and the clinical trial yield. One patient may have 10 benefits, 10 things we learned instead of one. It helps us combine in sequence, do we give radiation, then chemo, chemo, then radiation? Do we do both and then we do this? What do we do? How do we put it together? Which one do we wait? That's incredibly important. And then lastly, it helps us pick an individualized, precise treatment for each person. So now we're going to talk about a few of those markers. MGMT, we hear often. It is an enzyme within the tumor cell DNA that helps it repair itself, either from normal wear and tear or influence of treatment, radiation and chemo. We call this repair enzyme for short, MGMT. There is a beginning part that codes the expression or the making or the action of this gene. On the picture on the right, that's the yellow bar. There's a signature that says, hey, should I make this gene? Should I express this gene? Well, if we can silence it through a tool called methylation, we can silence that gene and not make it be able to express and be able to be active in a tumor cell, which means if we give radiation or chemo or other treatments or normal cell wear and tear, the tumor cannot repair its own DNA as well. That can predict better response to treatment and an improved outcome. Another critical marker to know about is IDH. That is a metabolism enzyme. So that blue puffy thing is meant to be a tumor cell. And I'm giving you a example of a organelle called a mitochondria, which runs the metabolism of the tumor. It's like the RPMs of your car, okay? And so the tumor's metabolism, there is an, a chemical called IDH that is an enzyme of metabolism. It is important in the formation of tumors, and if it's altered or mutated, it means that the tumor metabolism is wimpier in a, in a kind of a brief way to think about it. So anything we do to the tumor will work better. The tumor is less hardy. It helps predict treatment response and improved outcome. A third critical marker to know about is actually along the tumor chromosomes. So I want to have you look at the top figure, the left part. There are chromosomes, one is like a, mar a maroon and one is a green. We arbitrarily call the, the short arm and the long arm of the chromosome P and Q. Well, those two chromosomes, chromosome 1 and chromosome 19, they can get messed up as part of a tumor forming. And when they get messed up and there's a co-deletion of those two, the 1P and the 19Q, then the gene products that are not created in that tumor are um, affect, affect the tumor's ability to manage stress, including treatment. When there is a tumor, and we're going to talk about oligodendrogliomas as a, a signature tumor with this co-deletion, it can predict improvement, uh, improved outcome and response to treatment. I'm going to switch to secondary or metastatic tumors. They are very common, both in men and in women. Lung cancer, brain metastasis is the most common. Women breast, then melanoma, GI, GU tumors, etc. There are a cadre of markers for each individual histology cell type. If you have a metastatic tumor, get to know those markers, talk with your multidisciplinary team, and understand how they may help you select uh, your treatment and understand its behavior. Metastatic tumors often mutate when they spread. And one of our ABTA alumni recipients, Dr. Priscilla Brastianos, who has been a previous chair of this meeting, um, I'm going to show some of her work right now. She's done sentinel work along with other researchers here up in the panel and other speakers that are going to speak today to talk about how if you have a primary tumor of the breast and it spreads, 
every time it spreads, it may have altered or mutated, about 35% in breast adenocarcinoma, which is why oftentimes we ask you, can we retest the tissue? So in a primary tumor, we may have the alterations change through time. We're going to discuss a few types of tumors very briefly to get the foundation started for the next speakers. The first are astrocytomas, star-shaped cells. The histology pictures on the right are just to symbolize how complex it would be to try to figure out behavior just by looking at a slide. But through the benefit of integrated classification, we know that these infiltrating cells should be approached differently based on certain factors. One is the grade, which connotes its behavior. So lower grade tumors tend to happen in younger people. If good surgery is able to be done based on the location of that tumor, if it's resectable, sometimes early grade tumors can just be watched or undergo surveillance. However, tumors of higher grade often need to have surgery or best available surgery, maybe only a biopsy, and then always need some types of treatment at a varied number period of time, radiation, chemotherapy. Here's a plug for clinical trials. Always, 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 always consider clinical trials as one of your treatment options. Ask your multidisciplinary team. Second tumor we're going to talk about is an oligodendroglioma. Oligodendrocytes, the Latin term is cells within branches. The histology picture you see we often call chicken wire. There's a haloed out look to some of the cells and that's just an artifact. But these cells were easy to pick out by early histology patholo pathologists. But those are the cells that actually wrap around nerve axons and help insulate them, just like the color insulation along the electricity wires, the red wire, the blue wire. They're doing a similar thing. This type of tumor is molecularly defined as both having an IDH metabolism enzyme mutation and having that codeletion of 1P19Q. The presence of those two factors are Im impactful in selection of treatment, response to treatment, and outcome. If you have a lower grade and you have a good resection, often you can watch. If it's a higher grade or it recurs, you often need a combination of treatments, please ask and look for a clinical trial. And lastly, the last tumor slide is a meningioma. Meningothelial cells actually make up part of the meninges. The picture on the top right is a artist's rendering of a section of someone's brain on a sagittal or side view, like a profile. And from the skull, the, soft t the, the skin, the soft tissues in the skull, once you enter into the skull or the cranium, there is a lining that protects. There's a protective layer with cells, blood vessels, et cetera. That's where those cells live. The MRI picture down on the right shows that it is coming from that outside lining and pushing in toward the brain. It's not actually a brain tumor. The earlier grade or the lower grades often are resect or watch at the beginning, or maybe radiate if they can't be resected. But later tumors or recurrent tumors often need a combination of treatments and always ask and look for a clinical trial. That is the end of my slides. I want to thank you for the opportunity to introduce these selections of tumors. And let's get on to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about surgery, strategies for surgeries, and how we approach surgeries when we think about whether surgery is an indicator or not for brain tumors. Um, no disclosures to, to report. So when we think about surgeries, um, I think it's more important to think about why we have to do surgery, because the indications for surgery are often as important, if not more important, than the actual surgery itself, because picking the right patient and the appropriate patient and the appropriate type of tumor to operate on is really sets up the, the su success rate of the surgery itself. So we, st we should start out by talking about what are our goals when we think about surgery for brain tumors? Well, number one goal, as Aaron mentioned, one of the things that we need is diagnosis. And the only way to definitively diagnose a tumor is to have tissue to look at. Sometimes tumors can be very obvious looking, and then we know by their appearance, by the age of the patients, 
um, what kind of tumor it is with a pretty, pretty um, good amount of certainty. But sometimes it's not that clear because uh, the appearance is not as typical as, it, as we would expect it to be. And then we may need tissue. And the only way to obtain tissue is with surgery. Another goal of surgery is to remove a tumor for biological cure. Now, this may apply for some tumors, more benign tumors, in which surgery is the only treatment that's needed. Once you take out the tumor, you're done. You're cured. There's a very low chance of the tumor coming back. But for some tumors, more malignant tumors, there's always a chance of it coming back. So surgery just becomes a component of that treatment and not the end all of that treatment. Another goal for surgery is to remove the tumor for preservation of neurological function. Inside your skull, you have room for brain, spinal fluid, and blood. Anything else that doesn't belong in there and grows in there is going to take the room of those three other things. And they don't like to get pushed on. The brain doesn't like to get pushed on. And when the brain gets pushed on, it doesn't function properly. So one of the goals of surgery is to remove that offending agent and relieve the brain because we don't want the brain to get pushed on and not function properly because the longer the brain gets pushed on, the more potentially permanent that deficit can become, that injury can become. And before we continue, I want to talk about this, the ideas of the terms operable versus inoperable. These are commonly used, and patients come, and at one point they hear their tumor is operable or, or more often inoperable. And I think it's important to note that these are very subjective terms. We can operate on pretty much anywhere we want in the brain. We can access it with surgery. But the question is, should we? Is the risks of the surgery going to be um, overweigh the benefits of the surgery? And also, Accessing tumors that may be hard to reach may be a subjective matter. For one person, it may not be, it may be very difficult. Um, certain types of tumors may require very advanced skills or technologies or techniques. And so it may be operable in, in one area, in one person's hands, and inoperable in another hands. So it's, it's important to understand that those terms are, are relatively subjective. So when we think about surgery, it's really in um, a context of one of three different ways to treat things in general. Um, surgery is in addition to medical therapy or chemotherapy or medications and radiation therapy. And oftentimes it's easy for us to think of those three as separate entities. But particularly for oncology and in brain tumors, we can't think about them separately. We have to think about them together because we have to think about what can we do that provides the least amount of risk and the most amount of benefit. And if there are medical therapies or radiation therapies that can be done, it may be wise to do those instead of surgery. Or if we have medical therapies or radiation therapies that can supplement the surgery, we may want to do a less invasive surgery, a less complete surgery to allow medical therapy and radiation therapy to, to do its job. And so when we consider brain tumor surgery, there's, I kind of think about it in three different phases. First phase is before surgery, then it's during the surgery, what do we want to do during the surgery, and then the things that we have to do after the surgery. When it comes to before surgery, we have to first think about the diagnosis. Can we tell a diagnosis from the imaging? If we know the diagnosis and know whether it's a benign or malignant tumor, that really helps us determine whether you need surgery or the kind of surgery. If we, know, if we can have a clear idea on the diagnosis, we need to know what are the medical therapies? What are the radiation therapy options? Are, those, are there good options that can uh, circumvent the need for surgery? And if there is, it's obviously less risky than surgery. That may be a better idea. If, based on the diagnosis, uh, we decide that we need surgery and there are no better medical or radiation therapies, we have to think about should the patient get surgery? And that goes into performance status. We don't want to do surgery on someone that may be not be able to tolerate surgery or recover from surgery. Because doing the surgery and removing a tumor and having complications from surgery and the lack of be being able to recover is not a win in the end. And so we have to consider that. So during surgery, so assuming that we have a need for diagnosis, we don't have any other better therapies, and we have a patient with a good performance status, there are many different techniques of surgery, and we'll talk about that, and they vary depending on what the goal of this, that particular surgery is. And one of the things that's very important when we talk about surgery is extended resection. Obviously, we'd like to take out all of the tumor, but sometimes we can't. And so sometimes we have to weigh the risks of trying to take out all the tumor with taking out all the tumor, the benefits of taking out all the tumor, and that's something we'll talk about in a little bit. And then after surgery, we have to think about, depending on the type of tumor, are there options that we need to do to supplement, or treatment options that we need to supplement the treatment? They may include radiation, chemotherapy. Some benign tumors, you don't need any additional therapy. But when, if there is a need for additional therapy, we have to consider how does surgery play into those therapies that we're going to need later on? 
Because if you have surgery, you're going to need time to recover. You're going to need time for your wound to heal. You may not be able to start radiation or chemotherapy right afterwards. So these are all the considerations that a surgeon has to discuss with their radiation oncologist or medical oncologist to say, how does surgery fit in with these uh, proposed plans in the future? So now that we um, have selected a patient for surgery, we decided that you know, this is the best uh, indication for surgery. What are the strategies? And so I'm going to break down a couple of major strategies, uh, surgical strategies that we, uh, that we use for brain tumors. Most simply, stereotactic biopsy. And this is exactly what it is. It's a biopsy. It's a small piece of a tumor simply to um, acquire tissue diagnosis. So it's the minimum that we can do. It's not the, the goal is not to take out the tumor. We can make a very small hole in the skull with a small incision, place a needle using computer-guided navigation into the tumor, take a little piece of tumor out. The indications is that when we don't know the tissue diagnosis and we want a, we want a piece of tissue, or if someone may not tolerate a bigger surgery, they want a shorter surgery, we want uh, less blood loss, but we still need the diagnosis, this is a great indication for it. The advantage is short procedure time, small opening in the skull, small wound, and minimal tissue damage because, you, as you can see here, you place one needle down into the tumor. The disadvantage is that when you place one needle and take a small piece of tumor, as minimally evasive as it is, you can not get the uh, representative piece of tissue. So you may get a piece of tissue, and when we look under a microscope, our pathologist may say, it's not clear. You know, we, I don't have the right type of cells for me to diagnose. So that can happen. So that may necessitate a need for another biopsy. And also, if it turns out to be a type of tumor, which surgery is indicated, you may need to go back in for another surgery, so that necessitates a second surgery. So we have to be very careful about um, predicting whether you're going to need that second surgery to decide whether a biopsy is a good option or not. The next one is open surgery. This is kind of the workhorse of the removal of brain tumor surgery or, or craniotomy, opening of the cranium for tumor resection. The indications are tumors that would benefit from removal because surgery is really the only way to instantaneously remove a tumor from the brain. Radiation requires the, the tumor to be treated and for it to kind of take time to involute, but in surgery we can remove it like that. And so um, if there are tumors that are irritating the brain, causing cerebral edema or swelling or inflammation and causing neurological deficits, this is the way to reverse it as quickly as possible. The advantage is we can see what we're doing. We, it's an open field. And there are opportunities to use advanced uh, techniques such as functional mapping, doing the surgery while someone is awake, to take out tumors in very specific areas to not damage other parts of the brain. The disadvantage is it's longer operating times compared to a biopsy, and there's a risk of injury. When you're doing open surgery, when you're taking out bigger tumors in delicate areas of the brain, you can run the risk of injuring that, those areas, and so you have to weigh the risks and the benefits of the surgery. Another type of surgery is endoscopic assisted surgery. This is surgery in very hard to reach deep places in the brain in which we visualize it through endoscope, basically a camera at the end of a, a, an end of a long scope. We, we can use this to access tumors in the ventricular system, which are fluid spaces in your brain, or at the base of the brain, and commonly known as pituitary tumors, we place an endoscope through the nose to get to the base of the brain. Otherwise, to get to that area, we'd have to go through the top of the brain and cause a lot of retraction in the brain, and it can be a much more morbid procedure. The advantages can be very small incisions or, or no incisions, and you get direct access without brain retraction. Disadvantages, you're still seeing a very small space on a screen, even though you can, we have very good cameras now, but it can be diff very difficult to work in these areas, and there's a high learning curve. So there are people that specialize in doing this type of surgery because they do it over and over again. Another type of surgery that can be applied to both primary and metastatic tumors is laser interstitial thermal therapy. And this is kind of a, a type of heat ablative therapy in which we place a catheter down into the, into the tumor, and we treat the tumor, we kill the tumor by burning it and by the heat uh, uh, coming from the tip of the catheter. This can be used for very hard to reach tumors that we don't want to do open surgery for, uh, or previous tumors that have been treated with radiation or surgery that have occurred, and we want to treat it with a less invasive method. Very small incision, similar to a biopsy, but the disadvantage is that you, you place a catheter down and you're dependent on how well the thermal uh, function works to destroy the tumor, and if there's complications such as bleeding in the tumor, in these deep-seated tumors, they can be very difficult to treat. So those are kind of the main um, surgical types, but there's a couple of surgeries that may be associated that we do commonly in brain tumor patients. One is a shunt, or the cerebral spinal fluid shunt. And so inside your brain, you have spinal fluid made, and your body regulates it by draining a certain amount of fluid and making the right amount of fluid, so you have a set amount of fluid. 
but sometimes brain tumors can disrupt that equilibrium. You either make too much fluid, you don't drain enough fluid, or there's a blockage of fluid. And so you have too much fluid collecting up in your brain. So what we do to rectify that is that we place a shunt. We place a catheter into the brain, and we siphon the fluid away, and we put it in somewhere else in the body. So it releases the pressure in the brain. And this type of shunt, we can shunt into the peritoneal space, which is a ventriculo, ventr the ventricle into the peritoneal shunt, or into the atrium, into the heart, or into the pleural cavity where the lung sits. Most commonly, we shunt the fluid into the belly, into the, plur um, excuse me, into the peritoneal space, because it's a big space where we can dump a little bit of fluid in, it gets absorbed, it doesn't really bother anybody. So that's kind of the go-to area to place a shunt. But this can commonly be needed if someone develops headaches or what we call increased intracranial pressure or hydrocephalus as a result of a brain tumor or brain tumor treatment, and this may be, um, may be ne necessary to divert fluid away. Another common surgery that we perform is an Omaya reservoir. Uh, Dr. Omaya was a neurosurgeon that came up with this device, and it's like a shunt, but unlike um, a shunt which siphons fluid away, it's a catheter into the brain fluid space, and it's kind of like a port, like a venous port somebody may have in the chest. What this allows us to do is that sometimes the tumor cells get into the fluid space around the brain, and we want to treat that space directly. So this is a catheter connected to a reservoir in which we can take fluid out of the brain and also give medications directly into the fluid space and bypass the blood-brain barrier so that we can be more effective with our medications. So that's a common surgery that we do uh, for certain types of brain tumors. So now that we have our different t techniques, um, I want to talk a little bit about how we approach these tumors in both primary and metastatic tumors. So when we think about primary tumors, um, we have to ask a certain number of questions when we see a primary tumor. For example, here is a, a, on the top uh, picture is a glioblastoma, very classical looking, uh, classic for the age of the patient. Um, but we have to kind of predict whether it's a benign or malignant tumor because surgery strategies can be very different for whether it's a benign or malignant tumor. Location, is it operable or inoperable? And we talked about that, that's subjective. But is it an eloquent area of the brain? Eloquent means a highly functional area of the brain, the speech area, the motor area where damage to that area can cause significant um, uh, neurological deficits, and we need to be very careful. And sometimes it may preclude us from doing surgery because it's just too eloquent. It's just too far into that part of the brain. What are the goals? We talked about the goals earlier. Is it, do we want tissue? Are we trying to cure it by removing all the tumor? Are there going to be adjuvant therapy, additional medical therapy, radiation therapy? How does surgery fit into that? And do we need to take out this tumor because it's causing too much swelling, and we need to do it now to restore neurological function? And then finally, has there been previous treatment? Is this the second time around? Is this a recurrent tumor? A new tumor and a recurrent tumor can be treated very differently, and they have different surgical needs and approaches. A recurrent tumor may not be a tumor, maybe treatment effect, maybe scar tissue, and do we need to treat it with surgery? Um, it could have uh, also scarring, which makes surgery much more challenging. So when we approach a primary brain tumor and thinking about all those questions, first we think about for a newly diagnosed, first time around, primary brain tumor, we have to think about is it benign or is it malignant? Benign tumors, meningiomas, schwannomas. These are benign tumors that if you resect, if you get it all, you can potentially achieve a cure. And so that would be our main goal if we can do that with low risk. A malignant tumor, a glioma we know has a high chance of coming back. We may not want to be quite as aggressive. So these are conversations that you want to have with your surgeon. Do we need a biopsy or surgical resection? We know that if it's a benign tumor, taking it all out, complete resection, leads to cure, that will be our goal. For a glioma, we also know, uh, for GBMs, for glioblastoma, that taking all of the tumor out, getting that head start on removing that tumor may not be the treatment for, it may not be the cure for it, but is very important in the overall survival of how that patient does. And so that is very important. Can we achieve that? And we know that the more tumor we take out, the better everything else is set up with radiation therapy and medical therapy. And then finally, is it a cure versus a multidisciplinary approach? Is it surgery and then we're done? Or is it working with, together with the radiation and, and medical oncologist? For recurrent tumors, same thing. We have to consider whether it's um, tumor that's recurred or whether it's scar tissue. And, and that de de determines whether we want to do surgery or not. And then there are advantages and disadvantages of additional surgical resection. Sometimes it's very clear uh, when we take out glioblastoma that surgery is very necessary and it helps. When it recurs, it's less clear. The data is a little less clear whether more surgery is a good idea. So it, that becomes a conversation where we have in a brain tumor panel to say, should we do surgery again? Is it worth the uh, recovery of surgery? For metastatic brain tumors, the questions that we ask are, 
What's the primary malignancy? Where did it come from? Does it come from the lung, the breast, the, the kidneys? And that depends, and that affects how we approach it. Also, are there symptoms? Are they causing swelling and compression of the brain? Location, of course, we have to consider whether we can operate in that area or not. The size. Unlike um, uh, primary brain tumors, metastatic brain tumors can be treated very effectively with radiation alone, up to a certain size, and we'll you'll hear about that a little bit later. Can we treat it with radiation alone? Can we uh, uh, um, circumvent the need to put you at risk for surgery if we can treat it with radiation? And also the goals. Are we trying to obtain diagnosis? Are we trying to remove the tumor to um, help with neurological deficits? And then whether there's previous treatments. So finally, when we approach metastatic tumors, we have to ask, is there a known malignancy? Are there one or multiple lesions? Typically in a primary brain tumor, there are not multiple lesions. If you have multiple lesions for a metastatic tumor, we have to consider whether doing surgery on all of those lesions are worthwhile. The size of the lesion can affect whether there's other options like radiation and, and how effective radiation can be. And also adjuvant strategies. Even though a metastatic tumor is very well circumscribed, we know inevitably there's going to be microscopic cells around uh, when we take the tumor out. And we can't take margins of your brain like we do of your liver or your lung maybe. And so we had to follow that up with additional radiation. There have been a lot of work done in terms of doing radiation before the surgery to try to reduce the rate of spread of cells, and there are advantages and disadvantages to those strategies. So in conclusion, surgery of, of brain tumors is an effective way of removing both primary and metastatic brain tumors that can potentially allow for oncological cure uh, and also preserve neurological function. The ideal strategy really involves a couple of things, um, the least invasive and the smallest risk of neurological injury that has the greatest chance of maximal resection, that's our main goal, and then it has to integrate with the medical and radiation therapies out there. And it really needs to be developed with a part of a multidisciplinary team. We can't think about surgery in its own silo, we need to think about it in terms of what we are going to do or planning on doing and medically and radiation-wise. Right. Thank you. Hi, so um, thank you for this opportunity to share with you some of the stuff that we do in radiation therapy. A lot of times radiation seems to be a big black box. You don't know what's going on. We're hidden in the basements of many medical centers. So hopefully I can illuminate for you what we do and what you can expect. So I'm employed by the Cleveland Clinic, and I serve on the Clinical Advisory Board of the ABTA. So there are two main forms of radiation therapy. The first is called external beam radiation therapy, and this is the big workhorse of radiation. So we deliver x-rays or photons, and these x-rays, they're similar to your dental x-rays, but much higher in energy. So they pass from one side of your body to the other side of your body. Then we also have uh, different particles that we can work with, either electrons or proton therapies. Usually electrons are not used for patients with brain tumors, so I'll focus a little bit on protons a little bit later on. The other form of radiation therapy is called stereotaxic radiosurgery or stereotaxic radiotherapy. And this is the procedure that we do in conjunction with our neurosurgical colleagues. And here we deliver very high doses of radiation, usually in a single session for a small target. And there are many different ways to deliver this radiation. You can deliver it using a linear accelerator. You can use a cyber knife treatment system which is a linear accelerator that's on a robotic arm. There's tomotherapy that delivers radiation in a spiral matter. And then there's gamma knife radiosurgery, which uses gamma rays, so radiation coming from a radioactive source um, instead of using x-rays. So this is what a linear accelerator looks like. We call it a LINAC. So there's one linear accelerator in each room. A patient can lie on a radiation table, and the um, table can move up and down. We can change the angle of it. We also have this large arm that the radiation um, machine has. We call it the gantry, and that can go all around the patient. And within the head of the, arm, of the radiation, um, 
uh, gantry is a collimator, and this collimator can turn, right? And even embedded within that collimator, we have these leaves. We call them a multi-leaf collimator. So these leaves can slide into place and help us to shape the radiation and help us to modulate the intensity of the radiation such that we will be able to have a radiation plan that really conforms to your tumor. So the radiation looks like it's going around your entire tumor. So it's very much um, fits like a glove around your tumor. So a little physics lesson. Um, this is a depth dose curve that shows you what the physics of the radiation looks like. I'd like you to focus on the x-rays, the orange, uh, the red line as well as the orange line. So the x-rays, they come in, so in the x-axis is the depth, so radiation has to go from one side of your body to, to another part until uh, we hit the, the tumor and then it can exit. So at the, um, and then the y-axis is the relative dose. So if, if you focus on the red line, you'll see that the entrance dose is relatively low. And then the radiation dose that gets deposited is deposited within a few centimeters of the entrance. So there's a high dose called the maximal dose that's usually within two to three centimeters. And then uh, as the radiation beam traverses your tissue, the dose gets deposited and the amount of radiation deposited there or the dose deposited there gets smaller. So this type of radiation is skin sparing. So it's good for treatment of um, tumors that are a little bit deeper deeper within your brain, for example, gliomas um, that can be deeper. So we can treat the, the brain tumor um, and you can have fewer side effects on your skin. Now I'd like for you to focus on the orange line. This is the um, depth dose curve for a proton beam. You can see that the entrance doses uh, can be similar to what we see with x-rays. But you can see this very sharp peak at a certain distance from the entrance, and that's called the Bragg peak. And here, a large amount of radiation is deposited within that peak. Um, and beyond that peak, there's really minimal radiation. So this type of therapy is very good when we know that we want to treat a certain um, depth of tumor and then have a very sharp uh, dose fall off beyond that tumor. So let's see what this looks like in practice. So here you can see um, a photon plan or an x-ray plan uh, for a patient who's undergoing uh, treatment of the brain and also of the spine for medulloblastoma. And a radiation plan for the photon is shown on the left and the proton is shown on the right. And to treat the brain and to treat the spine, we have two radiation fields covering the brain and then two radiation fields coming from the back to treat the, the spine. And if you can see these lines, there's blue lines and orange lines in the radiation plans. So for our plans, we want to treat the brain and the spine to the 36 gray line, which is the blue line. And you can see that it covers the brain, it covers the spinal cord. Um, but in the photon plan, there's also an orange line. And this orange line is covering other parts of the body that we really don't want to treat. It's covering the heart, it's covering the lungs, it's covering the, the bowels. And so these patients in the long term can develop problems with their heart, they may develop problems with their lungs. They may develop nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea because of irradiation uh, to their bowels. And contrast that with the proton plan that's shown on the right. You can see that the blue lines and the red lines are very close together. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the blue line and the orange line, those are very close together. And the orange line is not extending into the other parts of the body that we do not want to treat. Uh, so patients that have these proton Proton therapy plans have fewer side effects uh, in this regard. And this is very important for patients, especially pediatric patients that are receiving radiation because we want to minimize the amount of radiation that they have to their normal tissues. 
So speaking of side effects, what are the side effects of radiotherapy? So the side effects really depend on the volume of radiation and the dose of radiation. So sometimes, like that case that I just showed you before, we're treating a very large volume, we're treating the entire brain, we're treating the spine as well. Um, other times, we're treating smaller volumes. We want to treat, say, a small metastasis. And the side effects will depend on that volume that we're treating, what's the extent of radiation that the patients are receiving, how large a dose are they receiving, and what tissues are receiving that radiation. Now, when you undergo radiation therapy, you can have side effects that we broadly categorize into acute and long-term side effects. So patients that are going through their treatment may find that they become more tired during radiation treatment. They may need to go to sleep earlier. They may need to take naps. Radiation to the brain can cause some inflammation. That can cause swelling in the brain, and that can lead to headaches, nausea, vomiting, uh, changes in their vision. Radiation to the brain can also affect the way that you, you've taste things. So foods that used to taste good may now taste metallic. They may taste like cardboard. Usually the taste will come back, but for a short period of time, food may not taste as good as it used to be. There can also be skin changes. So within the radiation field, um, radiation can affect your skin. It's just like being out in the sun. First your skin is fine, then it turns pink. It might become tan. You might even have some peeling of your skin. You can also lose some of your hair within the irradiated area. So patients that receive whole brain radiation, for example, will frequently lose their hair. Now that hair can grow back, but it might come back a different color or a different texture. Long term, we think about changes in memory and cognition. The normal parts of your brain that serve to, to help lay down your memories can be affected by radiation. And many of these uh, changes in your memory and cognition can be mild. And there are ways that we can mitigate it. There are drugs that we can give to you to help to reduce the changes in memory or cognition. There are ways that we can design your radiation plan to avoid uh, radiation to the memory centers in your brain, and that can also help to reduce this, the long-term side effects on your neurocognition. When we treat the brain, sometimes the nerves that control your vision, the nerves that control your hearing, are nearby your radiation fields, or sometimes they're even within the radiation fields. So we try to limit the amount of radiation that you receive to those nerves, but there can be a small risk of having changes in your vision or in your hearing in the future. You can also have endocrine problems as a result of radiation to your pituitary gland. Many patients will have fatigue during the course of the radiation. It will frequently get better, it should get better, but in some patients, they continue to feel tired, and that's because the radiation to the pituitary gland is not telling your thyroid to put out thyroid hormone to regulate your energy levels. So many patients will go on to receive hormone replacement therapies. Radiation can also cause scarring of your blood vessels, and that can contribute to some of the changes in your memory and cognition. For patients that um, are receiving radiation, especially children and young adults, uh, radiation can also cause cancers. It takes many, many years for this to happen. It's a very rare side effect, but it's something that uh, you should know about. And in children who are receiving radiotherapy, because the radiation is going to their bones and their growth plates are being affected, for patients um, that are receiving, say, craniospinal radiation, like in the pictures uh, that I just showed to you, they're having radiation to the bones of their head, the bones in their spinal column as well. So these patients can have stunted growth in those areas. So what happens when you actually sign on for radiation therapy? First, we go through a, treat, uh, a process called simulation. This is usually a one-hour appointment. And during this time, we plan out your radiation. So we simulate your radiation. We'll frequently make a mask for you, and this is a plastic mesh mask, and it molds to your face, and it prevents you from moving during the course of your radiation. So we want you to be in the same position every day, so we make this mask for you. 
And then we do a CT scan to help us to, to uh, work on your radiation plan. And oftentimes we will merge that CT scan with other imaging modalities such as MRIs so we get a better picture of what we want to treat and what we do not want to treat. And then we can design the radiation plan based off of that. So this is what a whole brain radiation um, field looks like. Whole brain radiation is very comprehensive treatment. It treats your entire brain. And frequently we will use this for patients that have many brain metastases, patients that have leptomeningeal disease or disease involving the lining of your brain. And there are some other indications as shown. So for patients that have whole brain radiation, we typically have two fields. You can see it on the bottom here. There's one radiation field coming from the left one radiation field coming from the right. On the top are beam's eye views of the images of the radiation. And you can see in the box, that's the radiation field. And we can use these multi-leaf collimators to block out our areas of the face that we do not want treated. So we blocked out the eyes, we blocked out the nose, we blocked out the mouth, we blocked out the back of the neck as well. And this is what a radiation plan might look like for a patient. This is a typical radiation plan for a patient with brain metastases. They often receive uh, two weeks of radiation treatment. So this patient received 30 gray over a two week period of time. You can see on the top that the entire brain is treated. Um, and on the bottom left, you can see how the nose and the mouth are blocked out from the radiation field. And before we get started with the treatment, we want to make sure that we're treating what, exactly what we plan to treat. So we take x-ray films called port films with a patient on the radiation table, and we make sure that these port films match up our planned radiation. So you can see the pictures on the, on the bottom, they match the pictures up on the top. So once we approve of that, then we can move forth with the treatment. Now we go toward more conformal treatments. So treatments still to large areas of the brain, but partial brain radiation. Uh, and we call it 3D conformal or IMRT radiation. Typically these treatments can last from three weeks to six weeks of radiation. So every day for about 10 to 15 minutes each day for several weeks. And we use these for treatments of patients with gliomas, glioblastomas, patients that have large meningiomas, and as I touched upon before, we could also do a memory sparing type of whole brain radiation called hippocampal sparing radiation. So this is what an IMRT plan looks like. We can um, treat uh, tumor. So in here, the tumor is colored on the CT scan. It's colored red and colored blue. And then we have critical structures nearby. We have the optic chiasm, which is shown in yellow, and we have the brainstem, which is shown in green. And you can see that with the radiation, we're treating to uh, two different doses, 60 gray, which is in the light blue, and 51 gray, which is in the green, in those lines. And you can see that the high dose lines, the blue um, radiation line, it's right around the red tumor volume. So it really hugs the shape of that. And it's off of the optic chiasm and off of the brain stem. So using IMRT, this type of technology, we are able to shape the radiation to the tumor that we want to treat and minimize the amount of radiation to nearby critical structures. And before we get started with the radiation treatment, every day the patient will have um, a cone beam CT, which is a CT scan that is done when the patient is on the radiation treatment table. And we make sure, is the patient lined up properly? And if not, then we can make small shifts in the patient positioning so that the patient is in the proper position. So here you can see the cone beam CT, which is shown in green, overlaid over the planning CT, which is the, the purple. So even more conformal than IMRT is stereotaxic radiosurgery. Uh, these are very, this is a very important modality to use for the treatment of brain metastases for patients that have small meningiomas and uh, other small lesions, whether benign or, uh, or uh, other functional problems like uh, trigeminal neurologists. So this is a picture of a gamma knife radiosurgery machine um, and gamma knife 
uh, instead of using x-rays, it uses gamma rays. So here you can see a patient who's lying on a table. There's a head frame that helps to provide coordinates and keep the head in place. And then all around, you can see these white lines all around the patient's brain, right? So that simulates what the radiation beams look like or these radiation rays look like. And the radiation, it's like... Um, the spokes on a bicycle wheel. There's lots of different um, spokes that come in and they converge right in the center. And similarly, with gamma knife radiosurgery, we can use about 200 sources of radiation. And where they converge is where we have very high doses of radiation. So this is very useful for patients that have small tumors and tumors that are very close by to critical structures. So for example, this is a patient I treated with a pituitary tumor, and the tumor is outlined in blue, and the optic chiasm is in turquoise right above it. Um, and the radiation that we're giving is very uh, quite high, 15 gray, but you can see that the eight gray line has dropped very sharply. So within two millimeters of delivering the very high dose of radiation, we can drop that radiation dose by about half. Um, and uh, a last slide, gamma knife radiosurgery or other forms of stereotoxic radiosurgery are great for treating metastases, especially small metastases. Uh, the arrow moved a little bit, but um, you can see that there's a round target, a circular target, uh, and we're treating that with a very high, highly conformal radiotherapy. Hi, everyone. I'm very honored to be here. Um, so my job is as a neuro-oncologist sort of to serve as the quarterback for any patient with a primary brain tumor. And so what I'm hoping to do today is to help you as patients, caregivers, loved ones, um, sort of understand the way a neuro-oncologist thinks and understand the different treatment modalities systemically that we use for primary brain tumors. Thanks. No disclosures. So mostly I'm going to focus today on the treatment of malignant gliomas, which, as Dr. Dunbar uh, explained, are grades two through four tumors. So the backbone of treatment, or the standard of care, as you've heard today, is maximal surgical resection, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy, which I'm going to focus on. But I also really want to point out, as Dr. Dunbar said, the critical importance of clinical trials in these diseases. Unfortunately, as many of you know all too well, we do not currently have cures for these brain tumors, so our job is to keep you as patients living as well as we possibly can for as long as we possibly can. And a huge part of this is developing new cures or new treatments, you know, that will hopefully lead to cures with fewer toxicities. So up front, you know, we talked about the backbone and then at recurrence, many more clinical trials often become available to patients, especially at the time of a first recurrence or a second recurrence. Other treatments that we consider at this time are re-resection, as you've heard, re-RT, as we didn't really talk about, but is also a treatment modality uh, that's available at times, second-line chemotherapies, and bevacizumab or Avastin. So, I want to start off by talking about the area that I think has seen the greatest progress and the greatest hope, certainly this year and really uh, since 2008 when these mutations were first described. So this is the treatment for IDH mutant gliomas. And specifically, there was a trial that just came out in the New England Journal of Medicine entitled Vorazizumab in IDH1 or IDH2 mutant low-grade gliomas. And I put this picture of a beautiful sunrise because we hope that this is the dawn of a new era in the treatment of these tumors. So this was a phase three study called the Indigo Trial for short, in investigating Vorazizumab in glioma. So vorsitinib is an IDH1 and IDH2 inhibitor. It is a targeted therapy. So you can think of that as a drug that sort of 
puts a key in the lock and fits in and turns off um, the engine of those cells. As Dr. Dunbar described, IDH um, is an enzyme that's involved in the metabolism of these tumors, and we think that it is a disease-defining mutation and a driver of the growth of these tumors. And so the concept is that by taking this drug, you can turn off the engine and stop these tumors from growing. So this was a phase three trial that enrolled patients with grade two IDH mutant tumors who had had prior surgery but not other treatment. So this is an interesting situation in this disease. Even though we know that grade two tumors are malignant tumors and that they have the potential to come back, often they're very slow growing tumors. And so the standard of care in these tumors has been to really watch and wait and to observe these tumors until the growth begins to accelerate or take off, at which time we consider doing things like sometimes further surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. So this was a different approach. So these patients were, stand, were divided or randomized to either a placebo versus vorsitinib or the IDH inhibitor drug. And so they had to have had at least one year after their surgery to establish a rate of growth of these tumors, but they had to have not had surgery more than five years prior. And these patients were randomized to get either vorsitinib or a placebo, and the patients who got vorsitinib were found to have a significantly longer time without progressing than the placebo group. And this actually happened very, very quickly. I think all of us in the field were extremely excited to see how quickly the results came out, and there was a significant change in what we call progression-free survival, that is the time before the tumor grows um, between these two groups. And the results were actually so striking that this trial ended early at the time of interim analysis, and all the patients enrolled were unblinded, means, which means that both the patients and their treating physicians found out what treatment they were receiving, if they were getting the placebo or if they were getting the vorsitinib, and the patients who were getting the placebo are now all getting the active drug. So this is very exciting, and you know we will see where this leads, but we hope to great things. Um, so, you know, these results have really convinced us now that IDH inhibitors can slow down the growth of grade two non-enhancing untreated IDH mutant tumors. And these compelling results bring into, the, into question the use of a watch and wait approach for these patients, which was previously commonly recommended. However, I would say there are many remaining questions that are still going on and still being investigated. So while this drug has been proven to now increase progression-free survival, as I said, and time to the next intervention or time to when your neuro-oncologist recommends a change in treatment, we do not yet know whether these drugs impact overall survival, and we will not know this for a long time. And that's for a good reason. These patients tend to live for a long time, so we have to see how these results play out over time, it's also going to be difficult because now the placebo group has obviously switched and is now receiving active drugs. So there are a lot of confounding factors to this. We also want to know whether there's a role for maintenance therapy with an IDH inhibitor, either combined with chemotherapy or after chemotherapy. So what I've talked about is there are this trial focused on grade two patients who did not have an indication for active treatment with radiation and chemotherapy, but there are many patients with grade two tumors that are much larger who we do recommend upfront treatment for. I'm gonna talk about them in a second, but we don't know after they've received radiation and temidar or radiation and PCV, whether maybe they should be on an IDH inhibitor for that period of time afterwards until their tumor grows, and hopefully it would prevent their tumor from growing. We also don't know if there's a role for combining an IDH inhibitor with chemotherapy. So I think these are unanswered questions at this moment. We also don't know if there's efficacy for non-enhancing grade three tumors. So right now we treat, or the recommendation and standard of care is to treat every grade three tumor up front with radiation and chemotherapy. But there are some more indolent grade three or slower growing grade three tumors 
which are non-enhancing, and they also grow relatively slowly, and there may be a role for these drugs in those tumors as well. However, it has not been looked at yet. I also want to bring attention to another area of exciting development for patients with IDH mutant tumors. This paper is now from a couple of years ago, a paper in Nature uh, by Wolfgang Vick and his group, which is talking about a vaccine targeting mutant IDH1 in newly diagnosed glioma. So these patients had higher grade tumors, grade three and grade four tumors. And this trial showed that a vaccine can elicit or cause an immune response to the vaccine, and these patients can mount an immune response. And these patients had very good overall survival and progression-free survival. However, it was a short period of time, and we also have to wait for these results to mature. But this is an area, area of ongoing work and study. So next, I want to turn attention to the management of specific types of tumors. So first, I'm going to talk about the management of anaplastic astrocytomas, or grade 3 astrocytomas. So the standard treatment for these tumors was determined through the CATNON trial. And this trial investigated the role of giving chemotherapy and radiation simultaneously or concurrently versus radiation alone and the addition of chemotherapy after the completion of radiation, which we call adjuvant treatment. So the results from this trial were actually very surprising. In glioblastoma, which I will talk about soon, we think of Temidar, which is the standard chemotherapy that we use in glioblastoma, as being a radiosensitizing agent. And we think that Temidar plus radiation makes the radiation work better and that patients do better when you combine those two modalities. This trial actually did not show that. It did, however, show that the addition of Temidar after radiation prolonged survival. So based on this trial, it suggests that patients with anaplastic astrocytomas should get treated with radiation followed by adjuvant temidar, and that's 12 cycles where the temidar, is, which is an oral chemotherapy pill, is taken on days one through five out of every 28-day period, and that is called a cycle. Um, so, you know, that has become standard of care for many people in this disease. Many other people, including myself, you know, feel that the negative the negative and the harm of giving the Temidar during the radiation is very little in most cases, and so many people have continued to give the Temidar with the radiation. And so I think that both ways are considered to be perfectly acceptable, and you know we'll see how this continues to develop in the field. The other thing that was not done in this trial is IDH status was not incorporated at the beginning of the study. This was looked at retrospectively, but we think what I'm describing really refers to IDH mutant tumors. So to get into it more, what is temozolomide exactly? So temozolomide is an alkylating agent. It's a chemotherapy, and it stops cells from being able to make or produce DNA. It's an oral pill that you take at home daily. Many people give it at night before patients go to sleep on an empty stomach. Other neuro-oncologists recommend that you take it in the morning, and some recommend that you take it within an hour of radiation. There are studies out there, I think, looking at all of these things. You know, I don't think that it's really clearly proven at what type of day the Temidar should be administered but daily, typically, during radiation for glioblastoma patients. And then that is followed by a four-week period where we let the body calm down, have your cells recover before we start cycles of adjuvant Temidar. The typical side effects from this drug are fatigue, constipation, nausea, and can be low cell counts. So patients who are on Temozolomide, as well as other chemotherapies, are asked to go to the lab and to get weekly CBCs or complete blood counts to make sure the counts are not dropping. It is not that common for counts to drop significantly with Temidar, but it can happen, and it's not 
unusual per se for it to happen. In terms of the other symptoms, you know, I think this is where your relationship with your neuro-oncologist and your radiation oncologist is very important. There are many things that we can do to help in terms of fatigue, constipation, and nausea, but it's really good to let us know as the symptoms are developing before things get to a critical point and that it's really interfering with people's quality of life. In terms of oligodendrogliomas, so these are tumors, as Dr. Dunbar described, that tend to be slower growing and more indolent, as we say. And so patients with oligodendrogliomas tend to have a long course of disease and to get many different treatments over the course of their disease. The other thing about these tumors is they are very sensitive to chemotherapy, and we know now that we used to treat these tumors either with chemotherapy and then we would watch them for a while and if they grew, we would give them you know, potentially radiation and then if they grew again, we might give them more chemotherapy. Now we know that you need to treat these tumors upfront for grade three tumors or for large grade two tumors that are causing symptoms with radiation and chemotherapy combined. What we don't necessarily know is which chemotherapy should be used. So as I said, patients with oligodendrogliomas live for a very long time, which is great. However, it makes doing clinical trials a little more difficult in this disease. So the clinical trials that were done were done with an older regimen called PCV. And a newer regimen, the temozolomide that I just talked about, has not had a chance to mature. There is an ongoing trial called CODEL, which is looking at the question of whether PCV or Temidar is better for these tumor types. But at this moment, we don't really know. So those who want to take a more traditional data-based approach to it often recommend PCV. But a lot of oncologists who have been practicing for a long time, who have seen a lot of the you know, more toxic side effects on PCV, often treat their patients with temozolomide, which is much easier typically for patients to tolerate. So what is PCV? PCV includes three different types of chemotherapy, procarbazine, which is an oral pill, CCNU or lomustine, which is also a pill, and vincristine that is given via an infusion or an IV treatment. These three drugs are given in a six to eight week cycle, depending on the patient's cell counts and when their body recovers enough to get another cycle of the drugs. And patients typically get six cycles of treatment, which takes nine months to one year, depending on side effects in that recovery period between treatment. Different chemo drugs are taken on different days of the cycle, and patients are often given a calendar to help them keep track and to understand when these different drugs are being given. The typical side effects are often pretty similar to Temidar in fatigue, constipation, and nausea, but there's also neuropathy, which is typically a result of the vincristine. Cell counts can drop to much lower levels with this drug regimen, often requiring some support um, with Neupogen, um, and that's often more severe. Patients may require transfusions. And based on trials in higher grade tumors, some patients, as I mentioned, are treated with temozolomide instead. So now I'm gonna talk about the treatment of glioblastoma. So glioblastomas, as you've heard, are unfortunately the most common and the most aggressive malignant gliomas. The standard of care treatment for this disease was established now based in 2005, and really, very sadly, we've been unable to significantly move the needle with this disease in the past almost 20 years. So the standard of care treatment here is following surgery is radiation with concurrent temozolomide, which is given daily for either three to six weeks, depending on how long your course of radiation is. The standard is typically six weeks. However, in older patients or patients who are physically not doing as well, sometimes we give a shorter course, which is typically three weeks. Then, as I mentioned previously, patients usually have a four-week break to recover and allow their bone marrow to recover prior to the initiation of six to 12 cycles of adjuvant temidar, which is given on days one through five out of every 28 days. And this is called the stoop regimen. 
So we know that patients with MGMT methylation benefit more from TMZ. Patients who are MGMT methylated have a longer survival when they're treated with chemotherapy and radiation followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. And unfortunately, patients who are unmethylated do not have a significant survival benefit when adding chemotherapy, unlike patients who are methylated. However, in the US, because of the lack of really better treatments for these, uh, this disease, most patients receive, receive temidar in addition to radiation. However, in clinical trials, because of the difference in response between methylated and unmethylated patients, often for unmethylated patients, an experimental drug is used in place of temidar. So with no proven curative therapies for GBM patients, Clinical trials are recommended as first-line treatment, and these are the guidelines from the NCCN, both for upfront and for recurrent disease in methylated and unmethylated patients. And I would strongly encourage, you know, anyone in contact with a patient with a primary brain tumor should consider enrollment in a clinical trial, and I would encourage patients to consider enrollment as early in the disease course as possible. You know, once these this disease recurs, it becomes progressively harder, unfortunately, to treat. So I just want to quickly sort of go over some important factors to consider for clinical trials. I think the number one thing is to pick a neuro-oncologist that you like and who you trust, ideally at a high-volume cancer center, if this is geographically possible. And really look to your doctor to help guide you regarding clinical trial selection. You know, I often say to my patients when the tumors recur, it's very overwhelming and people hear about a lot of clinical trials and everyone, all their loved ones are trying to help and sending them, sending them things about different trials going on and people feel very pressured to make the quote unquote right choice and unfortunately there is not a right choice at the time of recurrence. We just don't know which tumors are gonna to respond to treatment the best. And so the best person to guide you in that decision is your doctor who knows you and your case the best. Most, most clinical trials enroll at the time of diagnosis and at the time of first or second recurrence. There are phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials, and there are important aspects to understand about each type of trial. Phase one trials are asking, is this treatment safe? The advantage is that almost everyone gets an experimental intervention. However, the dose may change as the study enrolls. These are small studies. Spots are limited. A spot may have been available when you went to your doctor, and three days later, that spot may unfortunately be gone. And these trials are not designed to determine efficacy. Phase two trials ask, does the treatment work against the disease? And this is after the phase one trial has determined the safety and optimal dose. As the phase two trial progresses, decisions are made about whether the drug should advance to a phase three trial. And phase three trials are asking, is this new treatment better than the existing ones? And they compare the safety and efficacy of the experimental agent against other established treatments. These are often randomized, sometimes placebo controlled, but with brain tumors, I think it's important to understand that if there is a placebo arm, it is almost always added to another drug that is used to treat brain tumors. For example, you get Temidar plus a placebo versus Temidar plus an experimental drug. Tumor treating fields, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but this or the Optune device is a device that patients wear on their heads. You know, it's a magnetic current designed to stop or to interfere with mitosis or cell turnover. The great advantage to this is there are not a lot of systemic side effects to it. The disadvantage is for quality of life, you know, are patients who don't want everyone to know, you know, when they're walking around that they're sick. For recurrent treatments, for recurrent GBMs, patients almost always recur. And patients at this time often have tumor-related symptoms and morbidity. There's no clear standard of care salvage therapy. As I said, the treatments that recurrent often include Temidar Rechallenge, CCNU or BCNU, Bevacizumab, RERT, tumor treating fields if they weren't used up front. And I think it's important to consider palliative care for patients with a poor performance status at any point in their disease course. 
I'm not going to go into detail about the treatment of meningiomas. However, you know, as, uh, as Dr. Liu discussed up front, uh, the treatment is usually maximal surgical resection or radiation therapy. Grade one and grade two tumors are almost always cured with these treatments at recurrence or for grade three tumors, we consider systemic regimens, clinical trials, bevacizumab, sunitinib, and several other regimens. And just to end, for treatment of brain tumors, there are limited tools and the timing and order is critical and always let your doctor guide you. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Ralph and uh, Nicole, Mendy, and others, uh, obviously at ABTCA, who have done a great yeoman's job on trying to increase the patient advocacy. I would like to thank Drs. Liu and uh, Chang for the kind invitation uh, to talk about brain metastases and congratulate all my uh, fellow speakers for some very eloquent and comprehensive overview to set the stage for me to talk about brain metastases. And I designed my talk a little bit differently because you know, you've heard a lot about uh, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, more recently targeted therapies, which are drugs, which are designer drugs, specially designed to go and treat the, some of these genes which are driving people's cancer. Here I'm talking about brain metastases, so it's cancers from the rest of the body that go, are going to the brain. And I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the research and how it is truly transforming the outcomes of our patients and set a stage for hope for future. Uh, so this is my disclosure slide. Uh, so Dr. Dunbar did a great job talking about uh, brain metastases, laying the groundwork. So the most, three most common cancers that go to the brain are lung cancer, which is approximately 50% of the patients with brain metastases we see in clinic, breast cancer, and melanoma. These are the three most cancer, common cancers that have a propensity to go to the brain, but we also see colon cancer, kidney cancer. And now more recently, and I'll give you a flavor for it, the new designer drugs are really changing or transforming the outcomes for our patients and giving us hope. The interesting thing, though, is that incidence of brain metastases is actually increasing. And why is it that? Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. A, we are often screening now uh, with MRIs before patients go on clinical trials. And uh, Dr. Miller had talked about the importance of clinical trials and driving research and uh, in cre creating new opportunities for our patients. So a lot of these uh, clinical trials require patients to undergo MRIs. So sometimes patients may have a brain metastasis and we may not recognize it because they could be asymptomatic. So these trials are uh, requiring them to have an MRI, so we do that. Also, our patients with cancer are living longer. So if a patient who has systemic cancer, that means either a breast cancer, lung cancer, or melanoma, or other cancers, if they live longer, the cancer has a propensity to go to a sanctuary site, which is brain. So we are seeing more brain metastases than we have done in the uh, previously, and as Dr. Dunbar had talked about, these brain metastases, as a result, are 10 times more common as compared to gliomas that Dr. Miller had talked about. Uh, just a snapshot, uh, Dr. Chang had talked in her initial section about genomics, so it's very critical, and uh, Dr. Dunbar had talked about it, so it's very important when anyone gets diagnosed with cancer that you talk to your doctor that they are doing uh, extensive genomic profiling of your cancer because there are different kinds of cancers and there are designer drugs now which can treat them. So it's very important to know, unless you know, you cannot pick the right drug for the patient. So here is a sub, uh, it's a very busy slide. The take home message here is that lung cancer now has 10 or greater number of mutations. Some of them are more common like EGFR, KRAS, or ALK, and some of them are less common like HER2, BRAF, ROS, RET, uh, NTRAC. KRAS was, until recently, was thought to be undruggable. They thought there was no effective drugs that could typically treat this tumor. But in the last few years, there have been two drugs now which have been FDA approved, which can actually, designer drugs, which can actually shrink tumors and help people live longer and a better quality of life. One of the advantages 
that we had presumed that these designer drugs would have, that because they go after these specific genes that drive the cancer, we thought that they would have less side effects. And for the most part, they do compared to the chemotherapies where you're trying to go after every dividing cell. So sometimes, as a result, you may have drop in your white blood count, drop in your red blood uh, cells, or drop in your platelets. So that's why Dr. Miller had talked about when you're on chemotherapy, the doctors tend to do blood counts every week or every two weeks uh, when you're getting chemotherapy daily, or they do it every month if you're getting chemotherapy like five times a month as with Stimadart. With these designer drugs, though, some of the side effects include rash, diarrhea, fatigue. So they are different side effects, and they are very different based on the drugs, so too many to cover, but if someone goes on these designer drugs, the doctors always talk to them about the side effects they may expect, which are very different compared to the traditional chemotherapies that we've been used to treating these patients. Uh, again, uh, genomics matters, and depending on the subtype of patient's tumors, patients can live really long, and a lot of this is now coming from these designer drugs. And brain metastases, in a way, has led the field. Dr. Miller had talked about the exciting data that she talked about with borosidinib, which is a drug that goes after IDH mutant. Similarly here with ALK mutations, and I'll talk to you a little bit about the flavor, patients are living longer. And this is, again, too many drugs, so I don't want you to remember the names, but I want to uh, drive home perspective. So if you go from the top column to the bottom column, you can see response rates. What response rates means, not only are the drug preventing the tumor from growing, they're actually shrinking. And a lot of these times, these uh, drugs can completely shrink the tumor. So the new designer drugs are more potent. That means they are more strong going after the pathway that's designing, going, uh, driving the cancer, but also the new designer drugs now have a better blood-brain barrier penetration. What that means is there's a, this protective lining around the brain because of which a lot of our chemotherapies cannot get in, but these designer drugs, because they are small in size, they can actually seep through. So you can see these new designer drugs are being more effective, they are lasting longer, and they're giving a better quality life and better outcomes for our patients. There is al also has been a lot of uh, excitement about immunotherapy. So we know that the cancer induces kind of a shield around it so that the immune system cannot recognize and kill it because otherwise innately we have all an immune system and sometimes that can take care of some of these rogue cells which have a propensity to not die. So some of these immunotherapies now are really helping us shrink cancers, but what we find out in brain metastases, and that's the take home message from this slide, sometimes you have the immunotherapy that may work in the rest of the body, but may not work in the brain, but sometimes immunotherapies are actually working in brain metastases and may not work as well in the rest of the body. And Dr. Dunbar had talked about research from Dr. Brastianos' group showcasing that sometimes the mutations or alterations in the brain metastases can be different from the rest of the body. So similarly, we find out that the PDL one which is a driver of some of these uh, protecting the tumor from the immune system, the expression can be different in the brain than the rest of the body. And that's, that's why it's some, some Sometimes you see different responses. Uh, again, uh, same uh, driving home message. Depending on the subtype of the tumor, outcomes are different. These are also based on prognosis, as was uh, talked about by Dr. Dunbar. Some tumors just tend to grow more slowly. Some tumors tend to grow faster. But also for some tumors, we have better designer drugs. So always it's important that you talk about genomic profiling with your uh, treating physician to understand what may be driving your cancer so we can pick the best drug. Uh, just a snapshot about very exciting data that just came out. Until recently, we thought that uh, only small or tiny molecule drugs would get into the brain. So we thought that these new monoclonal antibodies, which have a, a, a charge payload to that, that means what we are trying to do now are designing drugs. Uh, these are called antibody drug conjugates. And basically what that means is you're recognizing the receptor, and we talked about the lock and key uh, phenomena that Dr. Miller had talked to you about, but we are also attaching a payload to that. That means it's like a Trojan horse. So you're using the receptor of the cancer to get in, but then you are blasting it with bombs, which is what chemotherapy does. But chemotherapy does it to every growing cell. But this approach only does it to the cancer cell and protects the normal cells next to it. And so initially we thought maybe these large molecules, because you have a payload now attached to a receptor, that they cannot get into the brain. But here we found out amazing responses seen with a, with a large molecule, which is like 
eye-opening and was a very pleasant surprise for us, those who do research in brain metastasis. So better news for our patients that these drugs are getting into the brain and are showing responses in brain metastases. And this now is an exciting element which may be tried for primary brain tumors as long as we pick the right targets to design these payloads. Uh, this uh, slide, just a uh, key point that I want to make with the immunotherapy, which works in brain metastases, that if you help shrink the tumor, you have these long lines that are going forward. There is a persistent shrinkage. The shrinkage curve for last for several years, some of these patients who were treated with immunotherapy with brain metastases a decade back are still living without, without the tumor coming back. So exhilarating data with brain metastases, with dual immunotherapy, that means sometimes you combine two immunotherapy, that works better than one. Uh, there is uh, obviously talk, if you get a complex cancer like brain tumor or brain metastases, where do you get care? And as Dr. Lou had alluded to, and you see this team here, it's a multidisciplinary uh, team. So you want to go to a center which has a proficiency in treating those types of patients you should talk to them about genomic testing. You need to make sure that the team of multidisciplinary uh, uh, physicians is treating you. That includes surgeons, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, neuro-oncologists. They're using the latest technologies. It's also important to see experts who have expertise in neurocognitive testing. Dr. Logan and other people will talk about that uh, in the remaining sessions. And always talk to your uh, physicians about potential of clinical trials, because sometimes you may have a new drug that may be in trials, but it might be very effective. And Dr. Miller had talked to you about phase one trial, phase two trial, phase three trials. So that's an important component. We always uh, propose that try to get your care, if possible, at a center that has uh, doctors which have a special expertise in treating brain tumors. Uh, this is, a, again, a busy slide, but this is, again, showcasing the power of genomics. And this is now patients who develop cancer uh, we can actually, looking at the genomic profile, predict who may, is, who may be likely to get brain metastases several years or decades later. Why is it important? We can specifically then pick to follow these patients with brain MRI. So for example, someone has a stage four lung cancer, that means they have a lung cancer that has spread to the rest of the body. They always need to get a brain MRI at diagnosis because lung cancer has a propensity to go to the brain. But with breast cancer, melanoma, typically these cancers go to the brain later on. So we don't do an MRI until a patient is symptomatic. And sometimes you want to catch these tumors when they are small. As Dr. Yu had talked about, they are focused forms of radiation which can really make these tumors disappear uh, and, and keep it under durable control for a long time, especially if we find them there when they are small. So this genomic profiling now can help us tailor make the patients who may need to undergo the MRIs early on compared to one approach fits all. We are in moving in this era of precision medicine where uh, genomic profiling is picking the right drugs but also can tell you your risk profile for developing a brain metastasis. Uh, moving on, uh, Dr. Lu had talked about one of the exciting things about uh, conferences like this is you learn about the latest technologies which are transforming here. So one of the things that I wanted to speak about today was the focused ultrasound. We are working with this platform and we talked about the blood-brain barrier which limits the drugs to go into the brain and that's why it's tougher to treat brain tumors compared to the tumors in the rest of the body. But this focused ultrasound leads to a non-invasive disruption of that lining around the brain so we can actually have large molecules like those payloads I talked about or immunotherapies from getting into the brain. And so one of the trials that we are working on uh, is uh, using this focused ultrasound and combining it with a drug called premlizumab, which is a drug that unleashes your immune system to go and uh, kill uh, cancer cells. And this has totally revolutionized lung cancer, melanoma, head and neck cancer, gastric cancer, ovarian cancer. And we, are, we have obviously tried some of this in primary brain tumors. We have not had early success. We are trying to look at newer ways of tackling this. But in uh, brain metastases, immunotherapies have shown a lot of success. And we are trying to see if we can increase the immune priming because focused ultrasound leads to disruption of the, some of the uh, areas around the tumor cell. And it can then lead to release of peptides and the immune system can then recognize it even better. So uh, what are some of the uh, uh, takeaway points today? If someone has brain metastases, it actually becomes a two-compartment disease. When medical oncologists like me treat those patients, we have to take into consideration what is going on in the rest of the body and what's going on in the brain. 
in the brain. I talk to my surgeons like Dr. Liu, Dr. Uh, Jennifer Yu, radiation oncologist, to see do we need to do surgery, do we need to do focused forms of uh, radiation, which Dr. Yu had talked about, which is now going more into vogue because it helps you prevent the neurocognitive decline that is seen with whole brain radiation. We have used a lot of these designer drugs and immunotherapies, and some of these immunotherapies and designer drugs can also be radiation sensitizers. Uh, when I was at Cleveland Clinic working with Dr. Yu, we designed a lot of trials where we have showcased that radio surgery works very well with uh, designer drugs and increases outcomes of patients even better. Uh, uh, these drugs also help us control the cancer in the rest of the body. With all these better modalities and more precise uh, targeting of the tumor, we can help better preserve the neurologic function uh, of our patients. Uh, we obviously have focused a lot of um, more in quality of uh, life issues for our patients. In fact, neurologic function has been used as a primary endpoint in clinical trials. We still need to find what are the appropriate tests and what are the time points to do it. But we know that the combination th strategies can lead to better control of the tumor and can lead to better quality of life. And as Dr. Miller and others have talked about, clinical trials we feel are critical to defining care in brain metastases like it is for primary brain tumor. And because this is a team sport, taking care of a patient with brain tumors or brain metastases is a stream support, uh, sport, it's important that you get multidisciplinary approach with a team of neurosurgeons, radiation oncologists, medical neuro-oncologists, which may use more than one modality to provide the best care and a best quality of life for our patients. With that, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much. So, um, Ambreen, you're gonna make a few comments about the question and answer um, session. So we'll now open this up to all of our panelists, and um, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, if any of you have a question that you'd like to ask, we'll be using the Whova app, so the conference app. Um, you can see the QR code right on the screen there, so if you haven't downloaded it yet, please go ahead and do it. You'll type your question, submit it, and we'll um, moderate the questions to our panelists. If any of you would prefer to ask your question in person, please just raise your hand and one of our volunteers will walk over to you with a mic and we'll answer questions as time allows. All right, so one of the first questions we have here is on um, the indigo trial. Dr. Miller, I believe you were discussing the indigo trial as it relates to grade two tumors. Do we know if this um, is a viable option for grade four tumors? So, so unfortunately at this point, it looks like the IDH inhibitors probably do not work well for grade four IDH mutant astrocytomas. So there was a smaller study that was done with a, a a drug called Tipsovo, which was a predecessor uh, to vorsitinib, uh, where they looked at patients and separated by patients who had non-enhancing disease and patients who had enhancing disease. And unfortunately, in the patients who had enhancing disease, they did not have prolonged survival uh, with the IDH inhibitor Tipsovo. So the reason for this, we think, is that probably patients with IDH mutant tumors over the course of the disease develop additional alterations in other cell signaling pathways, such as cell cycle signaling pathways, like CDKN 2A, 2B deletions, and that these pathways probably become more important for growth of these tumors over time so that the IDH inhibitors work less well. But we're still, we're still learning and trying to understand. There is a possibility of combining the IDH inhibitors with other drugs may work better in higher grade tumors. Thank you so much. Dr. Mendy. Uh, I just want to add to the point that Dr. Miller made. Uh, there are a number of now CDK4-6 inhibitors which are actually undergoing clinical trials, which may be more relevant for these tumors based on the cell cycling. Uh, signaling that she had alluded to. And, uh, you know, a number of these trials are open at our places and a number of other places. So maybe you should talk to your physicians about those trials because those drugs we think may work better in those kinds of tumors. Thank you so much. Do we have a question over there? 
Okay, never mind. All right, uh, Dr. Dunbar, in the beginning of the talk, you talked about the importance of clinical trials. Um, are, when, at what point in the diagnosis do clinical trials become an option for patients? Is it just during reoccurrence? Is it at any point from the point that you're diagnosed? That's a great question. Um, clinical trials should be thought of always. Um, I think of them as good ideas unproven, but for sure they add to your options you can choose from. So we think about we want the best, the best science, the best art. We need it to be as practically safe and as tolerable as we can guesstimate. And then there's also strategy. Is there, a, is there an option to do something bef sooner or later, either biologically like you've heard with how aberrations uh, evolve in a tumor or just because of how clinical trials and standard healthcare are laid out that something should go in order of one before the other? We think also about logistics. How hard is it on the patient, their loved ones? Is it every day? Is it once a month? Is it in intravenous? Is it sub, a subcutaneous? Is it a patch? Is it a pill? All of those factors go into your treatment options. And so clinical trials not only add potentially innovative ideas that may ultimately become the standard of care of the future, that you may have an opportunity to do at this time and maybe not another, but it also just actually adds options to your care. So get that quarterback on your team, get that multidisciplinary team that you trust, and allow them to guide you. And we'll talk about it at other sessions of the ABTA. There are excellent ways that you can approach searching for a trial along with your neuro-oncologist or treatment specialist. So let us help you. Thank you so much. We have a question here about Gamma Knife. Um, can you talk, uh, Dr. Yu, a little bit about when Gamma Knife is appropriate? Are there certain tumor sizes when it's not appropriate, certain tumor types that Gamma Knife is indicated for? Sure. So Gamma Knife is a way to deliver stereotoxic radiosurgery. I don't want you to be too caught up in the brand or the delivery because radiosurgery can be delivered by gamma knife, by cyber knife, linear accelerators. There are many different ways in which high quality radiosurgery can be delivered. Now the most common indication for radiosurgery is brain metastasis, especially for patients that have small and limited numbers of brain metastases. So what does limited mean? That changes a lot, and it depends on whether um, the number of brain metastases are very, very small, they're punctate, maybe two, three millimeters, asymptomatic. That's very different than a patient who has, uh, let's say, 10 of those little tiny punctate lesions that we can treat very well with radiosurgery, but that's very different than a patient who has, let's say, two large brain metastases, two brain metastases that are the size of plums or you know, golf balls. Um, in that case, radiosurgery might not be the best option for you. So um, frequently we'll think about doing radiosurgery for these patients that have very small diseases, small uh, lesions that need to be treated. Thank you so much, Dr. Yu. Another question we have here is talking about grading. Can uh, you touch on how you're able to grade a tumor that is unreachable by biopsy? Well, for grading of the tumor, uh, really we need tissue. And um, so if there are deep-seated tumors that we um, may have an idea of what the diagnosis may be, but we still need to confirm because we can't do radiation treatments or chemotherapy treatments typically for most tumors without a definitive diagnosis because we certainly don't want to guess. There are a small number of tumors in specific areas which we just don't access with surgery. And we have to kind of make the assumption based on what they uh, look like on imaging and treat it that way. But most tumors we still want tissue for. So we do access these tumors using stereotactic biopsy techniques, which we place a, a, the needle down into those deep areas to try to get a, a little bit of tumor with the least amount of um, invasiveness and risk to the adjacent brain possible. And hopefully we, that tissue, uh, when we review it under a microscope and look at, look at it histologically, are we able to achieve uh, a grading 
uh, and determine how aggressive and what kind of tumor it is exactly. Thank you so much. Dr. Yu, I have another question for you about radiation. Is there a maximum amount of radiation that you can receive in a lifetime before it becomes harmful? Right, that's a really great question. Um, so the dose of radiation that we deliver up front for the first time is based off of clinical trials. So we know that the dose of radiation can have, can achieve a certain tumor control. So it works well and we can minimize the amount of radiation. The question of how much radiation beyond that can we deliver safely um, is, uh, is continuing to evolve, and there are different ways in which we can deliver that radiation. So let's say, for example, a patient has um, large uh, volume radiation, IMRT-based radiation for a glioma, and maybe it comes back in the future, several, I don't know, a year down the road, and it comes back as a small nodular recurrence uh, within the radiation field, or maybe nearby that radiation field. At that time, we might consider doing a different form of radiation, like radiosurgery, to that small lesion. So sometimes that can be considered. Sometimes we have to go back and treat a larger volume of radiation. Let's say the patient has um, exhausted other systemic treatments, or, or surgery is no longer an option option, um, we can still deliver additional radiation for that patient. And there are ways in which we can try to reduce that toxicity of having the added radiation. But there is a risk of developing radiation necrosis, so parts of the normal brain that um, can die off and cause an inflammatory reaction. So we try not to repeat radiation if possible, um, but sometimes we do need to do that. And the longer time we have between that first round of radiation and the second round of radiation, because the brain can undergo a certain extent of repair of that radiation damage, um, the, the less the toxicity of that second round of radiation. Thank you. Did, does someone have a question there? Yeah, we have a question over here as well. Okay. Yes. Hi, my tumor is in the, um, it's along the anterior high left cerebral flex. It's uh, 9.7 millimeters. Uh, what part of the brain is that in, and could seizures occur? What is the, what's the prognosis of um, occurring, so reoccurring seizures? Could, could you repeat the location again? It's, um, it's along the anterior high left cerebral flex. Okay. I think it's, um, it's in uh, your tumor from your description is along the falx, which is the division between the two hemispheres of the brain, and it's um, anteriorly, so it's near the front. And so it really depends on what type of tumor it is. And sometimes you can tell by the imaging if it's a benign tumor. Um, if it's relatively small, there may not be anything that we need to do about it. A lot of benign tumors, like meningiomas, can be slow growing, and we can just watch it and wait. And if they're slow growing enough to not um, grow large enough to bother you, then we leave them alone. Uh, but that place, that area can be accessible with surgery, uh, relatively speaking. Are seizures, are they um, developing seizures? Is that common in a, in a meningioma? They can be. It's any type of irritation to the brain certainly can develop seizures, but it may or may not be from that, and so you need certain tests like an EEG to determine whether it could be coming from the tumor or not. Just because you have an abnormality, a, a, like a tumor, doesn't mean it's necessarily causing headaches or causing seizures. And so it really, you have really have to determine, based on what you think it is, based on other studies, whether that's really the culprit because you don't always want to just take out a tumor because it happens to be there. If it's a benign tumor, it may not be causing any issues, and the best thing to do may be just to observe it. Thank you. Can I add a little bit to that, please? Yeah. One of the things I'd like to add to that is that, um, in addition to what Dr. Lou said, is that we're, as your team, we want to try to predict how to prevent and, and minimize the symptoms you have currently but the things that you may have in the future that we can predict. So it may be that the multidisciplinary team can give a patient and a family 
some things that we are concerned may be in your future and say, what do we want to do with that information? Is there anything we can do to lower your risk of a symptom? Is there anything we can do to protect you from a symptom? So often we are having a discussion with our patients. Could this bring seizure? Could this bring early memory loss? Could this result in loss of mobility or control of bowel or bladder? And the things that we truly care about, and they say, what do we want to do about it? How can we minimize the chance that that happens or make it as far into the future as possible? And so that's an incredibly important thing to talk to your team about. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dunbar and Dr. Liu. We have a question here. Hi. I was diagnosed in 2018 with a softball sized mass, a glioblastoma, and I've been on a clinical trial for going on four years now with ONC201, and I was just curious if you guys have any patients on that and what your experience is with that drug. Hi, yes. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to hear you're doing so well. You look great. Um, so ONC201 uh, is a drug that's actually had a lot of usage, especially in patients who have a um, specific mutation uh, called H3K27M. Um, and that's a mutation that defines a subtype of gliomas, which I didn't talk about, uh, called diffuse midline gliomas. And these are tumors that are more common in the pediatric population and in the AYA, or adolescent young adult population. And there has been a lot of excitement and enthusiasm around this drug. Um, and a phase three trial is about to start for it. So I would say, you know, I certainly have had patients on it with varying outcomes and, you know, we're eager to see what the, what the phase three trial results will bring. Well, first the phase three trial has to be positive. So, uh, you know, it has to start and then evolve over time. So, you know, one would expect based on, you know, the typical survivals in that type of tumor that it will take probably at least five years or so for that data to mature and to accrue for the trial and to see the outcomes. And then, you know, based on the outcomes, the drug company would decide whether to bring it to the FDA or not. So it could unfortunately be many years down the line. But, you know, in a situation like that, if there are, you know, as with the Indigo trial, if there are very exciting results, sometimes, you know, trials will be stopped early and drugs will go to the FDA early. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. We'll take one last question, and this one is asking about tumor treating fields like the Optune device. What patients can use a tumor treating field, and when does that become a viable treatment option? And any considerations you could share regarding that? Of course. So I think the really nice thing about tumor treating fields is that most patients, uh, or most patients with gliomas, or specifically they've been looked at in glioblastomas, but can use them really at many different stages of the disease. So the strongest data uh, is for upfront treatment after the completion of radiation, and they have been shown to prolong overall survival in the upfront setting, but they've also been looked at at recurrence and sometimes, you know, for patients who have exhausted or used a lot of systemic options or who have a lot of systemic toxicities late in the course of disease, we, we recommend using them at that time as well. Great. Thank you so much. That is all the time that we have for questions. I'll hand it back to Dr. Chang.